Well, hello everybody. Welcome back to another edition of Telescope Man. You know, it's been several months now, probably five or six months, since I got into what's called DMR radio, <coughs> digital mobile radio. As you might remember, I stepped out there and bought a little MD380 uh, DMR radio and very reasonably priced, a little bit over a hundred bucks. I also went out and bought a Connect Systems 800. Uh, it's got about 45 watts and that permits me to hit the Dallas DMR repeater from way out here past Quinlan, Texas. Cannot hit it with this uh, little uh, four watt handy talkie. Uh, if you're looking at these, you might find two brands out there. I what's called a TYT380 or a Titera 380. Same exact radio, it just depends on what the dealer asks for. Uh, they've got two brands, exactly identical uh, on the inside. And uh, some dealers are selling a TYT380 and some are selling a Titera 380. Same radio, doesn't make any difference. Uh, anyway, I, I've made a few notes uh, about this segment of the hobby that I just wanted to share with you, and i got a few notes written down, so let's kind of go through them. Of course, originally, you know, DMR Radio uh, this was developed for the commercial business, uh, first responders, police, fire, and that type of application, that's really what it was originally developed for. And the software uh, for the radios follows the commercial aspect of uh, these kind of radios. Uh, you're going to find that uh, in the software, you're going to see features that really don't have a lot of application to the amateur radio uh, hobby. They were mostly developed for commercial applications. Also, if you look at uh, the DMR radio that your local police force fire, maybe some businesses are using for their delivery vehicles, you're going to notice they don't have a keyboard, they don't have a screen, they only have a knob that changes channels, probably going to be like 16 channels that you can dial to. And, and the reason for that is uh, you're dealing with people that don't have a lot of radio experience. So you just want to tell them, put it on channel 3 or channel 5 and leave it there. And we'll be able to hear you when you uh, push the talk. So that, that's why most of the commercial radios don't have this kind of a front on them. It's just a speaker and that's it. Um, when they came out to the amateur radio segment, they added buttons and a screen so that we could program the radio from the buttons. Uh, as point of fact, you really don't need those uh, at all if you're not going to do any programming from the screen or you don't want any extra features that are maybe given to you by these buttons uh, because you can program the however many channels they allow you with a little dial, just like you would this one. So anyway, keep that in mind. This was a commercial standard that uh, uh, amateur radio operators took to their own and have now been putting up repeaters all over the place. I know that Dallas is almost covered up with them. There's very few places in the Metroplex that uh, you could go to in and around the Metroplex where you couldn't hit one of these DMR repeaters. Uh, so they're expanding uh, very quickly, uh, not only here, but across the country, and that's good for the hobby. Uh, when you get into the software, you're going to find that there are some features in the software that really have little or no application to amateur radio. They're there for the commercial operators. Once you learn the software, you're gonna, you might say, well, why is this here? This has no use. 
Well, it has a use in the commercial arena, but not in the amateur radio arena. Unlike D-Star, uh, which was written for the amateur radio segment, uh, DMR was written for the commercial segment. So keep that in mind. Also, the software you're going to find is uh, a little more complex than maybe what you're used to. Um, it's not like a program like Chirp that you can download off the internet, very easy to use, you know, to program in some analog repeaters. <clears throat> it's pretty much obvious what each of the columns uh, will do in Chirp. Uh, you might have to read a little bit, but not very much. You're going to find that this DMR software has multiple pages, some of which you have to enter data on or change it, change some settings, and some of which you don't touch at all. So much more complex software than even, I uh, would say, the, the DSTAR software is, is not as complex. Uh, DSTAR, once you get past the call sign and the eight spaces and then you put a particular letter in there depending on what you want to do. Once you get past that little uh, thought process uh, you pretty much got it down. So, But it's not that way in DMR. There's a lot of terms that you're going to have to learn like color code, talk group, um, <clears throat> transmit, Yes, uh, if the repeater's in use, or transmit no, and wait till the carrier is clear, you know, things like that. <clears throat> so, uh, a little bit more complex than even D-Star, so keep that in mind. One of the bad things about it is, since it's a relatively new segment to the amateur radio hobby, uh, the repeater owners, and of course they bought the repeater, they spent the money to put it up so they can do whatever they want to do, but the repeater owners are constantly, it seems that way, constantly changing the configuration of uh, the repeater. It would be like an analog if every month I change the PL tone. The bad part about it is that Sometimes they don't communicate that to the users uh, in an effective way. And all of a sudden, your radio may not, you can't hit that repeater. You've been hitting it perfectly for the last two months, and all of a sudden it doesn't work anymore. wonder if it's off the air. Probably not. It's just been reconfigured. Either they changed the color code on one of the two uh, time sync channels, or they change the talk group to something else, some other channel to a different channel. Uh, they're not doing a really spectacular job in communicating these changes right now. So the only way you can really figure out what's going on is you're going to have to check into some nets and basically ask the question, has so-and-so, such-and-such repeater been changed recently? What's the latest color code, talk groups, etc.? Uh, you might be able to find that online. And then again, uh, if it's something real recent, you might not be able to find it online. So that's kind of some of the teething, uh, <laughs> the th teething things going on right now in DMR radio. Talk groups are changing, color codes are changing, network configurations are changing. <clears throat> I guess one of the uh, things that's kind of, a, to me anyway, a disappointment with DMR would be what's going on right now with uh, some of the statewide, worldwide, regional North America uh, talk groups. Uh, a lot of those are being changed now to push to talk and what that means is you key up the radio and now you can hear the signals that might be out there and after a period of time if you haven't keyed up again it drops you. So that's called uh, push to talk uh, in the DMR world. So 
a lot of the uh, talk groups, especially the wide area ones, are changing the push to talk. This is unlike D-Star, where you might just get on a uh, reflector and basically talk all over the world, or talk to people from all over the world. Um, it basically kind of prevents uh, the repeaters from all coming up at the same time. That's one of the good and bad things about DMR. So if you're on a worldwide talk group, and assuming the uh, repeater in this particular country is configured properly, and you key up, you will key up repeaters worldwide. And when you do that, you take over one of the two uh, time sync channels. There's only two of them. And now you've got one of them tied up, and nobody else can talk. Um, I don't know if this, my own opinion is this particular feature of DMR at the current time is going to really affect it. Uh, as far as uh, worldwide and even uh, regional North, North America wide communications because uh, you physically tie up those repeaters uh, when you do that. I don't know how they're going to get around that. Uh, they've tried, they're trying this push to talk right now and we'll just have to wait and see how that works out. Uh, so, you, so a couple of things. You have to really keep up with what the your local repeaters are doing, how they're configured. Now you can do this on the internet. You can do this uh, if you check into certain nets uh, that come on every week and just ask. Um, but it's uh, kind of a moving target right now. So you may or may not like that. Let's just call it experimental right now. A little bit experimental. Uh, a couple of other notes. Uh, I don't know how to address this one, but it, it really needs to be said. Uh, you're new to DMR, so you kind of jump around the internet. You find a bunch of Facebook sites about DMR, and you register on that Facebook site. And then you jump in there and say, hey guys, I just bought me one of these Tytera 380s. Uh, can you help me with this programming or that? Pro where can I find a code plug or whatever question you're asking? I have never seen this in any other segment of the hobby, but you're probably going to, I'm going to be real frank right now, you're probably going to get your ass chewed out by somebody on that Facebook site. And uh, they're going to tell you your radio is El Crapo, that you shouldn't have bought it. It's a piece of junk, um, on and on and on and on, and you're a dummy for doing that. And if you're like me, I wasn't sure if I would even like DMR radio, so I went out there and bought the lowest price thing I could find which was this 380 and also bought a Connect Systems 800, which is uh, also reasonably priced. And uh, wasn't expecting amateur radio operators to give me a hard time about that. I've never seen this in any other segment of the hobby, HF or VHF, UHF. You know, they might say, well, that particular radio has some quirks to it, and here they are. You know, but they're not going to tell you that it's a piece of crap, and they don't want you on their repeaters. Okay, but that will happen if you have one of these radios uh, with certain members of some of these Facebook groups. So keep that in mind. That's not very good for the this segment of the hobby to have people like that, uh, especially when there's folks that are trying something new and just looking for help and uh, they get jumped on. Now, why is that the case? Well, here's my own opinion. 
they've stepped out there and they've spent three to four hundred dollars on a Motorola or Hytera brand um, DMR radio. They also had to pay a couple of three hundred dollars for the software to program it. So now they got five to seven hundred dollars invested in an HT and they have a big head. They think they're uh, God's gift to DMR radio. And in fact, that even goes so far to say a lot of the networks are that way, as some of them have uh, said they don't want these radios on their network. And uh, if you're trying to grow a segment, that's probably not the way to do it. Uh, you know, you could say, well, that radio has this issue, so when you get a little more money together, you know, you might want to upgrade the radio. That's different, but that's not how they come across. They basically badmouth you uh, directly. So uh, I've dropped out of several of these groups simply because of the way that they have treated uh, new people to this segment of the hobby. I've just basically dropped off the group and I'll just do my own research, okay? So not very good. Only segment of the hobby, I really found that. Nowhere else do people say, well, why did you buy a Kenwood? It's a piece of junk. You know, I just don't see that in the hobby. I'll see, oh boy, you got that particular icon. Now look, the screen has this issue, so if you've got that issue with the screen, you need to get it back to the manufacturer, get it fixed up, you know, or something like that. But uh, no one says, well, that radio you just bought is a piece of junk. Uh, now, the whole time I've been making this video, I've had my CS800 on scan. It's been scanning uh, Metro Dallas and... Texas statewide. As you've seen, uh, I haven't been interrupted one time. Now, that just tells you there's not a lot of people talking on DMR radios. Okay, and I'm at five o'clock in the afternoon, so you know, there should be some drive by driving down the road people or something going on. But I'm not hearing anything statewide or Dallas Metro. Now, you will hear people talking from time to time. I'm not trying to say there's never anybody on there. But it's not very often, except if you check in during a net. And there are some scheduled nets on DMR. And when you check in during the net, there's going to be a whole bunch of people on the net usually 20 to 30 people on the net, so, um, which is pretty good for a net of any kind. Uh, not a lot of action going on, so my advice to you is if you want to check out this segment of the hobby, you don't spend a lot of money. Go get you one of these TYT380s, get you a CS800 or something like that, where you can just, uh, if you don't like this segment of the hobby, you can turn around and sell it, get both, most of your money back. Or you might turn out to like it. Now, I'm going to sit around while all these changes are going on with repeaters and changing color codes and talk groups and all that stuff is going on. I'll wait about a year. I'll do another one of these videos, God willing, if I'm still alive in another year and kind of tell you what's been going on. But uh, some things, these are some of the things you need to consider uh, before you take the jump into DMR radio. Anyway, my own opinion, yours might be different. Your mileage may vary. And like I usually say, I wish you clear skies and 73. And remember to keep looking up to see the greatest show on earth right over your head every single night. I'm going to roll that telescope out in a minute. See y'all later. Everybody have a great day.